Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to our second autumn webinar, um, a second in this series in autumn, uh, which is an in-house job today. Uh, so um, welcome. My name is Jasmine, as I'm sure many of you know, and I'm the director and curator of the Stained Glass Museum. And I'm joined by my colleague, Emily, who is our collections engagement officer. Um, so we won't spend too long introducing um, myself because I'm the speaker for this evening. So um, thank you for, for joining us this evening. And um, this evening's talk is, is kind of a combination of, of things. It's, it's to celebrate and talk more widely about the new acquisition that the Stained Glass Museum acquired earlier this year. Um, but it also kind of crosses over to some of my research interests to so some of the, the kind of ideas um, I'll be talking about this evening are things I've been thinking about for a while uh, myself anyway. So the work that we acquired, as I'm sure you all know, is by the contemporary American artist Kahinda Wiley, who was born in 1977 in Los Angeles. He is a leading portrait artist, um, primarily a painter, but his body of work also includes photographic portraits, figurative sculpture and stained glass. And the panel that you can see a detail of on the screen there um, is the first stained glass in the museum's collection by a known black artist. And this evening, what I want to do um, is to introduce Wiley's artwork um, and talk about his recent move into stained glass, its place in his portfolio of work, um, and we'll draw on the kind of issues around the display and reception of his stained glass, uh, and also try and situate it in the wider history of stained glass. So bear with me because that's, that's quite a lot to cover. Um, I should mention that we will, we will touch on the representation of black people in Western art history. And I should acknowledge that I do not specialize in contemporary art or studies of race and empire. Um, but as a white woman working in a cultural institution, um, I definitely want to actively support anti-racism and decolonization in the sector and in our wider society. So just a quick note on, on terminology, um, I will be using the terms white, black and brown uh, during this, this talk, although they're homogenous terms that do not recognise the kind of complex ethnic, geographical and racial identities. Um, they're terms that avoid hierarchy by not referring to minority racial groups. Um, and they're also terms that are used by Kahinda Wiley. So it's, it's my intention there to, to kind of be able to talk about the representation of people of colour um, in artworks. It's not my intention to make anyone feel uncomfortable, um, but language is important and just wanted to kind of recognise that and acknowledge the fact that it's changing all the time. So this, as I'm sure you've seen, because we've been um, posting it everywhere all the time, is our new acquisition entitled Saint Adelaide by Kahinda Wiley, made in 2014. Um, it's a stonking piece. It's actually 2.5 metres high um, and over a metre wide, so it's big. And you can see here um, the, the figure of Mark Shavers, um, as it's inscribed into the plinth, is here uh, dressed as Saint Adelaide. So he's a single standing figure of a young black man wearing distinctive gold trainers, pale denim jeans, a white and navy stripy jumper with a sleeveless denim jacket over the top and a fur around his neck. He carries a clasped book, a cross and orb and scepter in his left hand and a golden coin in his right. And a large golden halo can be seen around his head. He's shown standing on a plinth inscribed with the name Mark Shavers and set against a diapered background of blue glass beneath two Gothic arches and surrounded by a decorative border of ruby, green, white and yellow glass. So questions we often get asked immediately, who is Mark Shavers? Why is the piece called Saint Adelaide? Um, and I hope that that will become clear. Um, the answer is really um, that because it references a historic work depicting St. Adelaide. Um, and you can see a cartoon for that work here on the left, which was actually designed by French painter Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres um, in 1842 to 43. And Ingres' cartoons 
uh, for stained glass were actually transformed into stained glass by the Royal Manufactory at Sèvres in France um, around the same time. And this particular window depicting Saint Adelaide um, it was installed at the Saint Ferdinand Royal Chapel in Paris, which was erected in memory of Ferdinand Philip of, of the Orleans family. Uh, so he was the son of King Louis Philip, and it was a, a royal memorial chapel. He died falling from a horse. So Kehinda Wiley's panel, um, Saint Adelaide, is titled after the original historic work which it references. You can see that very clearly here. You can see that it's made of three main panel sections that absolutely mimic the form and construction of the historic window fabricated by Sev. So the title of the work, the overall pose of the main figure, the attributes, the plinth that he stands on, um, the blue background, the Gothic frame, the decorative border, they're all carefully imitated. But the difference, of course, is the figure. And here we have uh, a young black man, Mark Shavers, in the place of the female empress. Saint Adelaide of Italy was a royal home and empress by marriage. She was crowned with her husband, Otto the Great, um, in 962 in Old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And in Anger's depiction, you can see she's uh, her status as a kind of um, royal holy Roman empress is donated by the, the royal regalia, the, the crown there on her head, as well as the, the cross, uh, orb and scepter. And those really, those are symbols of her authority uh, and status in the holy Roman emperor empire. The presence of a purse around her belt and a golden coin in her right hand represent the charitable act of giving alms to the poor. But in Wiley's Saint Adelaide, these symbols are seen in the hands of Mark Shavers. Mark Shavers, as far as we know, is a photographer and a model based in Brooklyn, New York. He's an ordinary man like you or I. Just to focus on the coin in a minute, because it's one of the, the differences here. Um, Angra's Saint Adelaide looks downwards. She holds her coin out as if she's giving charity, giving a coin to the poor. Shabers, however, is depicted quite differently. His head is held high and he held, holds this coin in a very different manner. Um, it's actually held between his thumb and forefinger like this. And I don't think he's receiving the coin. I think he's questioning it, or holding it up um, for, for questioning. And it's, it's a kind of interesting shift there. And it's, it's quite an interesting shift in all actually, this whole, this whole piece, because we have the, a young black male taking the pose of a holy empress, who's here a white female, based on a design which was first conceived by a leading 19th century French academic painter and destined for a window in a chapel which acted effectively as a funerary monument for French royalty. So we've got a lot of play here with representations of power, of race, of status and gender. And as one critic has acknowledged of, of Wiley's work more broadly, as, as we will see, um, and this is a quote, by putting images of African-American men in poses that were previously reserved for saints, nobles and royalty, Wiley questions conventional portraiture and societal representations. So those switches that he makes really shift the balance of power um, in this image and make us reflect on the role of portraiture in stained glass and more widely uh, in representing the real and ideal, the mortal and immortal. So I think this work playfully reimagines a historic image, um, and I do think it is playful, um, but it also has a serious dimension too. And it's a work that um, is, has been produced through mediation, mediation of an image uh, and transgresses time as well. So it's subject matter kind of simultaneously alludes to the early um, medieval Christian empire, 19th century imperial France and present day America. Now, this is one of, to date, 12 freestanding stained glass artworks that Kehinda Wiley um, has 
conceived um, and on top of that he's also made and an conceived one site specific work which we'll also look at and I will show you all of those tonight but before we delve any further into you know what I've called Kahinda Wiley's stained glass art we should recognize the fact that Wiley is a hugely successful commercial artist um, but he is a portrait artist who works primarily on canvas he is not a stained glass artist um, and all of his stained glass works have been made by specialist glass painters um, in Slow Art Studios, a Czech Republic studio headed up by Richard and Jitka Kanter, seen here with Wiley at one of his exhibitions. So in terms of the, the craftsmanship and, and the glass, the quality that we're looking at, the painting, um, this, is, this is the work of, of Richard and Jitka. Of course, this kind of commercial relationship between um, artist and craftspeople is not unusual at all. Think of um, Jeff Koons um, and, and many other big, big artists, they, they collaborate with, with craftsmen. But we wanted to acknowledge um, the craftsmen by, by name this evening. And Wiley um, is, is really kind of going in a long tradition here, because if we look at the history of stained glass, uh, many famous contemporary artists before him have designed and conceived stained glass windows, but not actually made or, or painted the glass themselves. Um, and amongst those people, you know, we can name names like Joshua Reynolds, Benjamin West, uh, Ang, Burne Jones and John Piper. And all of those artists, I think you'll agree, helped to regenerate the art of stained glass and think about new subject matter in the medium, although the stained glass was actually made by craftsmen uh, elsewhere. So to properly understand Wiley's body of stained glass, I think it's helpful to have a bit of an understanding of his work as a painter. And as I'm not quite sure how familiar you all are uh, with his work, I just wanted to kind of run through that quickly. Since the early 2000s, um, Kahinda Wiley has made waves in the art world with his spectacular, often larger than life paintings of black men and recently women, um, many of whom take the place of white sitters in traditional paintings um, based on European old master paintings. And they often have the addition of his trademark colorful patterned backgrounds, which you can see uh, very clearly here in this image of Wiley in his studio. So to look at one of these in detail, and um, this is a very well-known um, example of, of his works, and it's part of his Rumours of War series, uh, Napoleon leading the army over the Alps. Uh, made in 2005, this painting um, is, is based on a painting by Jacques-Louis David. Um, and as you can see, the title of the work is, is again referencing the original historical work that it's based on as you can see here. But in Wiley's painting, we have a black man in military camo, Timberland boots and a bandana, astride a rearing horse, who takes the place of the young General Napoleon. Um, the original painting was painted to celebrate Napoleon's win at the Battle of Marnio in, in 1800. And in place of the cloudy sky and mountains that formed the backdrop of um, David's painting, Wiley has favoured a red ground embellished with gold floral motifs, which has the kind of appearance of wallpaper. And in between the gold motifs, um, barely different, barely visible from a distance, are these jewel-like silver sperm cells, a symbol of sexuality and virility, which combines in this image to read a kind of, of a hyper-masculinity, if you like, um, associated with power, pride, accomplishment and, and perhaps aggression too, uh, whether military or otherwise. So it's quite interesting just to point out these details and you can see what first appears a very simple substitution. There's often a bit more going on. It's playful, it's fun, but it's also serious. And on the um, rocky outcropping in the foreground, um, inscribed with names of great historical military commanders, Wiley has added Williams, who is the model for this man astride the horse. And aside from his name, uh, we know very little else about the man sitting in the saddle, in contrast to the famed general whose role he assumes in the painting. 
And this is the case with most of the, the sitters in Wiley's portraits. His work is often created out of um, chance and choice. He uses a process um, which is basically street casting to find his models and he'll go um, and approach individuals in the streets and the shopping malls um, and, and say, hey, will you sit for a portrait of mine? In his own words, he's drawn to people with a sense of self-possession and strong personality. But then in the studio, um, they're invited to, to look at reproductions of historic artworks in a book. Um, typically, but not exclusively, these are paintings, and they have a dialogue about what image they want to look like um, and, and what clothes they will wear. So he invites his sitters to kind of select the work of art and their clothes and gives them some agency over the way in which they're portrayed. And agency is really important here, especially um, for young black men who continue to be misrepresented um, and often vilified um, by society. Uh, and, and as you've probably gathered, Wiley's work uh, focuses on black men and women. He's often cited an influential moment in his career upon moving to New York just after he graduated with his MBA, when he found a New York Police Department printed mugshot profile in the street. And this was complete with the name, photo, date of birth and other identifying details of this individual. And um, a few years later, because he had this kind of up in his studio, it was a real um, influence, he, he produced uh, this painting called Mugshot Study, in which he transformed the stereotype, um, a kind of criminal profile of a young black man perceived as a threat, the hunted, if you like, into a beautiful work of art. And again, this is a, um, a theme in Wiley's work, but also something that he can personally relate to. Um, he, he has said, I know how young black men are seen. They're boys, scared little boys, oftentimes I was one of them. When I lived in LA, I was completely afraid of the Los Angeles Police Department. So Wiley's experience as a young black man growing up in America really strongly influenced his artistic career. He was born in Los Angeles, as I said, in 1977 to an African-American mother and a Nigerian father. Um, his, his father, who was Nigerian, came to the US on a scholarship um, and returned to Africa to work as an architect not long after Wiley was born. Um, so his mother raised six children, including Wiley, um, and from a young age recognized her son's talent for drawing worried about the environment um, that she lived in and the kind of lure of the streets. She encouraged this talent and enrolled him in after school classes to keep him busy aged 11. And by age 12, he was one of 50 American children who, was sent, um, who went to live in Russia for a while to study art and the Russian language, uh, which must have been quite an opportunity. And of course, a very impressionable time because of all the amazing art um, in the galleries there. So Wiley graduated from Los Angeles County High School for the Arts, where he had access to Los Angeles galleries and particularly admired the portraits um, by Gainsborough and Constable. At this time, he began to travel to West Africa uh, to search for and reconnect with his father, who had been estranged from for most of his life. And when he visited Nigeria, he noted, I felt like a stranger like it wasn't my story. For me, being black started with slavery with America. And it's just important for us um, here in the UK to kind of recognize the, the US's relationship with slavery quite different to ours. Uh, the United States of America is a country that emerged from European settler colonies that witnessed the displacement of native peoples and the atrocities of systematic slavery, the legacies of which still abound today. Um, and as Wiley has openly acknowledged, I think you can see from that quote, um, that history is, is part of his identity. So he gained his Bachelor of Fine Arts at the San Francisco Art Institute in 1999 and received a scholarship to complete his Masters of Fine Arts at the Yale University School of Art in 2001, where he also had exposure to some of the leading collections of European art. 
And although much of Wiley's early works focused on the depiction of young black men in America, since 2006, 2007, through his World Stage project, um, he's extended his portraits to depict black and brown youth across the globe. Um, and he's been to uh, Lagos, Dakar, Brazil, India, Sri Lanka, Israel, France, Jamaica, uh, Haiti, Tahiti, um, and that world tour is, is, is still going. So he'll go in street cast in these different uh, countries, uh, usually in the city, a main city of that country, um, to, to find sitters. And they each have a kind of a different flavor, if you like, which um, he absorbs the kind of culture and the patterns um, of, of that culture. So on the left here, um, we've got an example from the Lagos Dakar world stage um, tour, if you like. And until his 2012 series, An Economy of Grace, um, he'd remained very much in his comfort zone, depicting black and brown men only. But in the last 10 years, um, women have gradually been incorporated into his work. So you see um, one of those on the right here. Um, Wiley is a highly skilled portrait artist. I think you can see that from these paintings. Um, and his work became even more known in 2018 when he was chosen by the 44th President Barack Obama to paint his presidential portrait for the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Um, and this portrait is unusual, actually, in that it does not include an underlying art historical reference. So uh, kind of breaking new ground. So that's a kind of very brief summary of his paintings. And I, I think you can see that Wiley's work speak to us um, about the iconography of power, um, but they're also beautiful monumental works. They draw you in with the color, the pattern and attention to detail, and not to mention the physicality of their subjects who happen to be bold, black and beautiful. Um, and Wiley really applies this familiar visual rhetoric of the heroic and the powerful, the majestic and the sublime used in historic painting tradition to the representation of contemporary people. And that's the, the flavour of his works, which he has branched out into stained glass. So it was in 2014 that he, he first um, started to think about stained glass or, or at least first stained glass works were made to his designs um, and he, he produced six panels at this time again all made by Slow Art Studios. Um, you can see one of the exhibitions here the, the first exhibition that these these panels were shown at and, and made for which was his, his major retrospective exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum and, and there is um, St Adelaide. So St Adelaide was one of the, work, the first stained glass works uh, made to Wiley's designs. And I think it's, it's clear why he was attracted to stained glass, having looked at some of his paintings, the vivid colour, um, the bold pattern. I mean, this is something that we see in almost all stained glass, very bright and colourful, often with patterned backgrounds. Um, and also, we forget this, but stained glass is actually uh, a monumental figurative art form. So we don't tend to think about it as portraiture. Um, but most stained glass has figures in and um, figure, figures represented in the glass and therefore it's, it's kind of a natural uh, extension of his work perhaps and a place to think about the codified language of portraiture. So it's an, it really an extension of his interest in, in grand narrative and portrait painting. Um, and as we have seen, Wiley is known for his kind of recreations of historic works. And St. Adelaide is actually um, one of, one of the, the first six works that he made, but is also part of a series of three. So three of the, the first six stained glass works um, made to his designs uh, are, are these three, which were all based on the cartoons for stained glass by Ang, of which you saw some earlier. So here we have alongside St. Adelaide, St. Remy and St. Amelie. Different models um, based on the different saints, but part of the same series, if you like. I think, yeah. So here are the original cartoons that they're taken from. And I think you can see there that the, the poses are broadly speaking, uh, the same with some slight changes to the kind of angles of heads um, and of course the main change being the clothing 
and um, the substitution of these uh, elevated saints for ordinary black people. Now, some of these cartoons and designs were made for uh, windows at the St. Ferdinand Royal Chapel. You can see here those two. Um, and others were made for the Royal Chapel at Dre, which they're, they're kind of two chapels made at very similar time that Ang and Sev were involved in both. So um, interestingly, uh, Wiley has seen these three as a series, but actually they're derived from windows in different buildings, um, although both in, in the outskirts of Paris. And this is where we start to really interrogate the historical references and his relationship with them, because um, you can see here we've got uh, the, the designs for um, uh, Amelie and Adelaide. Fairly um, standard, you can see the design for Ang and the Sev windows as they were made, uh, not adapted at all actually. But you can see that Ang did not think about the leading. He was the artist. Um, the Serb studio would have broken that into a kind of leaded window and worked out exactly how many pieces of glass and, and where the lead lines were going to be. And these, these are all um, kind of a, a gothic frame. But the St. Remy window, as I said, that was at Dr, um, actually, Angra's cartoon was adapted uh, for a slightly different window. It's much more, much more gothic window um, with a, a, a kind of cusped trefoil head there and a gothic canopy as well. Um, and this is a kind of significant observation uh, for, for those of us who study stained glass and, and I was pleased to, to learn it because it's quite clear that Wiley has um, looked at Angra's original designs here. That's been his source not the actual stained glass, but the design for it. And these designs, um, cartoons, are, are all in the Louvre's collection. And I think that he saw them in a book and rather liked them. And that's uh, where he uh, decided to, to kind of reproduce them. He don't, I don't think he, he did it from the glass and I would be surprised if he's actually gone to see the glass. So an interesting thing there to note. So the remaining three, three panels in that series, the first series of six, um, are more ambitious um, and playful, but perhaps less successful in, in my mind. Um, so, so let's think about what's different for Wiley working in, in stained glass then. Um, Wiley's other artworks, and especially his paintings on canvas, um, that on the one hand, they have general appeal, but they also have a specific appeal for those with intimate knowledge of the masterpieces from which his compositions are borrowed. But in some of these cases, the stained glass windows, um, the original stained glass is barely recognisable. And I have to say, I think most of the public would not recognise any of the sources that these windows are based on. Um, you, you have to really know your stained glass to, to, to know these. But were it not for the title, um, that directs us directly to the sources. So, so Wiley is actually encouraging a dialogue um, between the original and his recreation. And that's true of all of his uh, paintings, sculpture and, and the stained glass. And some of you, I'm sure, because I'm sure there's some stained glass bots uh, listening tonight, will recognize that these are actually three uh, based on panels in the Victoria and Albert Museum's collection. So in place of St. Ursula and the Virgin, uh, young virgin martyr, um, you have this young man. And you can see, interesting, there's a kind of subtle change in the entourage around the main figure here, um, because they have slightly darker skin in Wiley's version. Again, very kind of faithful to the backdrop, um, little, very few changes made to, to the way that the, the kind of uh, curtain across the back and the column um, and the, the kind of wreath um, above, even the tiles, very, very faithful. But we have, again, contemporary clothing and Timberland boots and a slight change of skin tone for the people in the, the entourage around him. The other two go a step further in their kind of appropriation of a historic image um, because they actually substitute the secular language of heraldry um, 
for black people. Um, so, or, or here, heraldic bearers, because we have two supporters here on, on the right um, who have been changed for, for these young black men who um, quite hilariously um, appear to have, you know, dropped a mobile phone. That's what it, it looks like because they, they seem to be holding something that's no longer there. So it's kind of an interesting idea to, to do that. Um, not sure how successful it is, um, but I'll leave that for you to judge. So he's retained the, the heraldic frame and the pose here, but he's, he's done away with the actual heraldic shield. And in this one, um, the man takes the place of the heraldic shield, um, the arms of Nicolas Ruterus, the Bishop of Arras. And that's the title of Wiley's work, um, but you know, makes less sense without the actual heraldic badge, although he has kept the motto and um, the monogram behind. So this, this selection of windows is, is really um, interesting because the, the first three that I showed you, they were Gothic Revival uh, 19th, 19th century windows. And, and these three are, are kind of 16th century German Renaissance uh, glass, some ecclesiastical, some heraldic, um, and quite, quite interesting. Um, none of them, I don't think, none of these historic windows that he's based them on would, would make the short list for kind of the world's stained glass masterpieces, although some are in um, significant collections, uh, they, are, they are barely known. So, you know, what, how, how did the artist select them? Um, well, I think from a book, actually, and I think that's how he uh, is, is looking at a lot of his historic works. But either way, Wiley isn't just a painter who has conceived some of his work in the medium of stained glass, but he's a painter who's engaging with historic stained glass in a direct way, um, and in a direct way that we haven't seen since the Gothic Revival period. So for me, that's interesting. At the same time that he was exploring these first works in stained glass, um, he was also exploring the themes of sacred and secular in, in some other series, um, including this Memling series 2013, in which he produced a series of small scale oil on wood panels with gold leaf gilding um, complete with opening doors, which appear as altarpieces. And these were inspired, um, as the name suggests, by 15th century Flemish master Hans Memling. And there's, there's eight portraits here um, in this series presenting contemporary sitters in the place of historical figures. Um, and they provide a more intimate viewing experience presenting the, the sitters as objects of devotion and desire. Um, but he's retained the naturalistic backgrounds, interestingly, here. Um, and this one is particularly interesting because the original and, and Wiley's version um, has a kind of image of a stained glass window in the background. But the, these portraits are kind of three quarter uh, length portraits. They're almost pinups as well as devotional objects. Um, they invite meditation and, and reflection, um, but perhaps also some, some, some gazing. Um, Wiley is a gay man, and the focus on the male body is, is a real focus in, in his work, as you can see here. Um, it's quite a nice little uh, icon for a gay man, um, as much as Memling's original um, icon would have, and, and donor would have um, fitted a kind of church setting. Um, so there's a kind of secularization and sexualization of the sacred. So Wiley's series of stained glass panels, including St. Adelaide, probably needs to be thought about in the wider context of these works, which is why I'm just showing you um, one example here, and there's, there's many more, um, because I think they mark a kind of turning point in his work. And his second series um, of stained glass is actually the series that I first became aware of um, when they were made in, in 2016 for an exhibition um, entitled Lamentation, which was at the Petit Palais in Paris. Um, and, and I actually went to see this show. Uh, I went solely to Paris to see this show. Um, and it was Wiley's first exhibition in, in Europe. And this, this was an interesting exhibition where there were the six other freestanding works and, and they're all quite different um, because these works um, are much larger figurative stained glass works, often including more than one or two people in the, the stained glass composition. 
um, and they were displayed at the Petit Palais, of course, alongside its collection, um, which includes very large paintings and, and sculpture, and, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later. So all the historical references for this second series of six um, were actually based on Gothic revival stained glass windows depicting the Virgin and Child. And the subjects are more politically provocative, or at least more obviously so. Um, and this is also the first of his stained glass to include some, some female portraits as well. So a bit like the Ang series, there's a series of three um, based on um, another Gothic revival window. Um, this time, um, the Gothic revival window was by the Italian Giuseppe Bertini. Um, and Wiley has substituted figures of the Virgin Mary with, for portraits of young black men and women from Brooklyn, dressed in contemporary clothing of their choice. We've got football jerseys, baseball caps, jeans, high tops trainers, diamond stud earrings, flashy watches and chains. Um, and the Christ child here in, in all of these is a young black boy. So that's those three, and you can see all the background and composition is the same. And they're all variations actually of this um, original. Well, this the original original is lost, but this is a, a replica of the original that was made by Bettini, um, now in the um, Vatican on, on the left. So you can see here that he's he's kind of retained the, the frame of the chair, the decorative foliage and, and the, the floor, the plinth, the angles, all, all of that is, is very much um, copied after Bertini's original. Um, but the positions of the models are more varied. Um, and whereas the, the Virgin Mary is kind of shown as a demure woman, um, the black mother here is very confident. The pale Christ child holds a lily and the black child holds a bamboo cane. And these are subtle but deliberate switches, which again prompt further reflection, um, especially, I think, because the bamboo cane is, is a nod to the history of slavery and racial acts of violence. And I want to take a moment to appreciate the kind of technical um, work that the, the Czech glass painters at Slow Art Studios have, have undertaken here because the details, and I was able to take these details um, myself actually when I visited the glass, are exquisite. Um, look at what we've got here. We've got this nail polish, very contemporary um, nail polish design on the, the bottom left there, uh, very, very arty. Uh, we've got these little tattoos uh, on, on the mother's neck, we've got this shiny football, um, this, which, which really looks like leather and looks brand new, um, really fantastically executed and, and very colorful. And trainers, shoes are a real detail here. Um, so you've got some, some fantastically painted trainers and, and brands like Nike do, do appear often. Um, I guess these are the kind of contemporary uh, objects of, of significance, if you like, that 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 mark out um, portraits and, and symbols in portraiture. So some some fab details. So a fourth panel of the Virgin and Child, titled um, Saint Mary, is is after an, an Austrian Gothic window, and and this was particularly memorable because I, the 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 green background was was slightly a bit lurid for me, um, but what I really remember and glad I photographed these amazing high heeled red and leopard print lace up boots, which I hope you're appreciating because you've probably never seen any shoes like it in stained glass, um, and and they're produced in in flash glass acid etched so technically uh, really really also excellent um, but also quite stunning so the final two stained glass in this in this latter series of three standing panels um, you can see here and these are much larger works with multiple figures there's quite a lot going on here and you can see again there are two versions of of the same kind of image um, called Mary Comforter of the Afflicted. Both are actually based on a German um, stained glass window, I think depicting the, the uh, Assumption, um, but also with, 
with a, a particular iconography here because we have um, in kind of injustice around the, the Virgin Mary. And that's that's very important here because we've got the young, the old, the imprisoned, um, the Lady Justice blindfolded. Um, and the focus is undoubtedly on the, the centre two figures in place of the Virgin and child. And I, I think these two are very much about the brutality against and the murder of, of black people, especially young black men. So in both, um, we have a young dead black boy being carried, um, very poignant. Remember, these were made in 2016, but these, these are issues that are in the news all the time and especially um, came to the forefront last summer um, with the Black Lives Matter uh, protests following um, the murder of George Floyd. So these are kind of more bold and politically charged um, critique, um, but this is, is kind of mixed with a fascination uh, of, of luxury, fashion and contemporary symbols in our society, because I'm sure you can make out uh, there are logos on, on the clothes. Um, the trainers are, again, very much contemporary trainers. And I think I've got some more details here, um, just so you can see how exquisitely uh, Wiley's hyper-realistic style, um, mediated by photographs often, um, has been rendered in painted glass by, by Slow Art Studios. Um, they've kind of ca captured that very, very well here. A beautiful rendering of the black skin and this detail of the hair, which is, is painted in a kind of mid-tone grisaille and, and stippled um, to give the eff effects of, of really, really a kind of hyper-realistic um, black hair. I wanted to think a bit about the display and reception of these works and the kind of general subject matter in, in, in art history. And um, it's it's good to, to, to show you this. This is an image I took of the exhibition in, in Paris, the Lamentation exhibition. Um, it's really important that these works were created as exhibition pieces. They, they weren't designed for a building. They are freestanding exhibition pieces because the European masterpieces within our galleries and our museums, um, within these walls, black people are, are rarely represented. And when they are, they tend to have the status of an exotic curiosity or a servant or slave. Um, so there's a very interesting kind of power uh, imbalance that these works in the middle of the Pretty Pali Gallery really challenged. Um, remember Wiley studied in Russia, and he also had access to the great American collections. He's very much trained in a, a traditional manner to be a, a portrait painter. But throughout his experience studying art, traveling and, and living um, in, in, in America among these, these collections, he rarely saw people who looked like him on the walls. And as, as he says, painting is about the world that we live in. Black men live in the world. My choice is to include them. This is my way of saying yes to us. So the gift that Wiley gives his sitters um, is actually to be represented in a way in which they want to see themselves represented. Those he meets in the streets are kind of transformed into artworks of their choice and seen on a gallery wall. And that's quite powerful for the everyday person in the street to become one of those people um, adorning the walls or in, in the center of these, these galleries. And, and the works at the, the Paris show fundamentally changed how I was viewing the artworks around them, which I'd walked past many, many times. Um, and just to kind of give you one example of that, uh, this glass was, was very close to this, this sculpture by Barrier, um, depicting the, um, the first funeral, Abel, Adam and, and Eve. And this very white, marble sculpture um, about death and murder here contrasted uh, or, or very interestingly related to the, the stained glass uh, which, which is also about death um, and murder um, but about black people as well and it was just, just very powerful though just rethinking some of the relationships between these artworks around and you know, these are the sorts of paintings, these are two of the paintings on the wall around this glass. Um, and they just looked very 
full of white people, <laughs> um, even more so um, after we'd seen something different in the gallery. So these contemporary works really have a power to kind of change the way that we look at artworks around us. And I think for the better, um, there's interesting conversations that go on and, and Wiley deliberately wants to do this with galleries and galleries are really um, enjoying having that collaboration um, and engagement with him. And, and I believe that there's an exhibition opening soon at the National Gallery, his first uh, at the National Gallery, um, where he will probably be engaging in some of the works uh, at the National Gallery and, and maybe there'll be some new pieces. So worth going to London for this autumn. And just kind of build, building on that, I thought it was worth reflecting on the representation of race in stained glass. It's not something that's often talked about, um, but there is, there is of course black and brown people in, in stained glass, but certainly in medieval and Renaissance glass, um, almost always uh, one of the three magis, as this example um, from um, the v &A collection shows. Um, we've got kind of dark skin tones and, and very typical features um, of, of what they would have in the 16th century uh, seen as an Af African, a kind of stereotypical African man. Uh, we've got earrings, the tight curls of the hair, and of course, um, darker skin tones. And um, one of the, the three magi um, was often depicted this way um, because the three magi were often seen to represent the three known continents at the time, um, which, which was of course, uh, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And that was very common and it, con it continued um, and, and still continues today, but it continued in the 19th century. This is a 19th century version uh, doing exactly the same. Um, this is in Howsham uh, Church in, in Yorkshire. And you can see there's a nice, very strong contrast between the very pale white skin of the Virgin and Christ child and um, at least two, two of the, the Magi here. And during the um, 19th and 20th century, stained glass was, of course, a powerful medium for, for colonisation. Um, its imagery helped spread the propaganda of British Empire. And a lot of this kind of agenda can be seen in, in stained glass at the time. This is a very well known example, the Jubilee of All Nations uh, window from um, Great Malvern Priory, which depicts um, Christ. Uh, ascending to heaven and around him um, is, is kind of the, the Te Deum, it's the whole world. And you can see that various peoples representing different ethnicities and places uh, are reproduced here, but it's very much um, how the Victorians viewed the world. And of course, biblical scenes, um, the other place in which it, black people in St. Glass appear often uh, is the, uh, he seems from the New Testament, such as, as Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, of which you've got two examples here. Very interesting that sometimes um, purple glass was used to, to or, or dark blue to, to show black skin. And that, that's something that goes right back to the medieval stained glass. And of course, both at home and in colonies, um, stained glass windows also kind of showed the lives of righteous missionaries who brought the good word medicine and educated the, the subjugated people. So this is a, a very classic example um, of a window erected in memory of Bishop Halber, who was Bishop of, of Calcutta uh, in the 1820s to, to, to 1841. Um, and it, it shows the kind of dutiful lives of, of those uh, devoted to conversion, but it's a very one-sided portrayal um, of, of relationships and, and especially between races. So these are examples, of course, which are mostly in, in the UK um, and America has a, a kind of a different story, but uh, similar and more overt symbols of, of kind of racism, if you like, in, in stained glass. And, and they all have different contexts and histories. We have, we have to remember that. But what they have in common is that the representation of, of black or brown people has been used to reaffirm ideas of racial hierarchy um, constructed by, by generally white people in the position of power or dominance. Of course, that's true of most Western art. It's not something that's, that's surprising really, um, but, but stained glass of course is a quite public art form. Um, and it also thrived in institutionalized context. So it, it's even more so less surprising that that, that exists, um, but very much still visibly present today. And I think going back to, to Wiley's work, his work 
is really exists in complete contrast to those images which were created by and large uh, by and for white people. Um, as a black artist, he is providing a positive intervention that, that places portraits of contemporary black people centre stage and in positions usually reserved um, for people like the Holy Family, saints, bishops and noblemen. And his works are portraits of people with real names like Mark Shavers. They aren't types or stereotypes. And importantly, as we've learned, they've also had their own agency within the image and its creation. So Wiley's work is, is deliberately derivative, but also provocative. Um, and it, it's partly because of its being derivative that it is provocative. And I think it encourages dialogue. So, so for us, these works have enormous relevance today. And I think that's why we gained public funding to, to purchase this uh, panel of St. Adelaide for the, the permanent collection. Um, and it is our job as a museum to welcome all people. And I have to say that we have noticed a great deal of more diverse visitors visiting since we've acquired this piece. And we've given lots of opportunity for people to come for free to see it. Um, he represents a minority artistic group, not currently represented in the museum until this piece um, was, was acquired. It also, of course, um, has a great dialogue with existing pieces in the museum's collection, and this is something that we will be um, producing some kind of educational resources on. But we've got these fantastic kind of royal portraits, so there's a lot to be said about portraiture and, and uh, individuality um, and power, pride, symbols, um, and, and in a way it's a very traditional piece that, that fits very nicely with the works that we already have. And it enables us to kind of explore those underrepresented issues of identity, multiculturalism, race, gender and religion at the Stained Glass Museum, which isn't something that, that all of our works lend themselves to. So, so it's a great educational resource as well, this, this piece. So finally, just to um, show you, because I promised to show you all, all of Wiley's glass, uh, very excitingly, early this year, um, this was installed and it's his first site specific stained glass commission. Um, it's an expansive triptych glass ceiling that was installed actually, I think very end of last year, so 31st of December, 2020, um, in an extension to the Pennsylvania, New York railway station. So it's a stained glass ceiling. Um, and within this public rail station, station, Wiley's kind of broken out of the museum and gallery spaces to create an enormous, even more accessible public artwork, which probably has even more impact because of, of where it is. And in doing so, he is actively helping to shape the future of stained glass in, in the public sphere. And again, these were made by Slow Art Studios. So th this is titled Go. Uh, the work moves beyond black representation mediated by famous images um, of white people because it depicts contemporary black New Yorkers breakdancing. And you can see that in, in celebrating this kind of modern dance style, which originated on the streets of New York, um, he celebrates the power, beauty and talent of unfettered black bodies in motion. And you can see those bodies moving here. Um, based quite um, obviously on some of his early paintings, actually. Um, here's a beautiful up close shot. Um, of course, it draws on the European tradition of frescoed ceilings. You know, you can you can cite the Sistine Chapel. This is a very contemporary version of, of a similar effect. Um, but the urban environment here becomes the, the celestial dreamscape and it speaks of possibility. As the New York Times put it, instead of angels and gods in classical frescoes, Mr. Wiley offers Nike logos and pigeons in mid-flight. And as for the pigeons, probably another first for stained glass. So that's that's all the slides that I, I'll show you this evening. Um, thank you for listening. And I might invite Emily back and hope that she can um, ask any questions, but do use the Q&A, sometimes easier to find. 
Thank you, Jasmine. That was fantastic. It was so interesting to see such a variety of his work in so many different mediums. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you could either use the Q&A function, which if you're on a laptop or a computer, it's along the bottom bar. And if you're on an iPad or a phone or anything like that, it's, it's along the top. Or obviously there's the chat function as well. I was going to maybe start with a question while everybody thinks of theirs. <laughs> um, so I wondered, you said that the Czechoslovakian factory, they design the glass and, and create it and paint it. Do you know if Wiley has any, um, in, you know, any kind of influence on perhaps the glass selection they choose or has sort of any kind of edit process that, or is, is it once he's designed it, he hands it completely to them and uh, they, they design it as they, as they choose? Yeah, um, I have been in touch with the, the studios and we we're in a kind of dialogue and I did ask some of these questions. Um, as you can imagine, Wiley's quite busy. He doesn't, he's kind of stopped answering my questions after we bought the work. Um, but it's my understanding that he sent over um, cartoons. So um, he knew what size he wanted them to be, knew what colour. He'd obviously already kind of composed the images and, and had his sitters. And then the glass was, was matched um, very closely to that. And I think... Um, besides a sample panel um, or, or two would have been left to the, the studio. Um, they've obviously got a good working relationship because as I pointed out, it's the same studio uh, making the, the, who made the ceiling. And that's, you know, six years after the first glass that was made. Um, but they're very, very skilled painters. I think um, that the quality of the, the painting and the, because there's a lot of enamel painting here as well. Some of the colour comes from enamel painting on glass. It is, is quite exquisite. There's also layers. Um, yeah. It's so impressive to see up, up, you know, up close in person. I also thought, you know, the sort of the top of the arch around St Adelaide, but also on, uh, was it Remy and Amelie on those panels? I wondered if perhaps that was inspired by sort of his West African heritage, that kind of almost like a wax material kind of print mm. along the top that kind of geometric border I wonder if that's perhaps an influence for him yeah that's interesting because it's in is it in the original Ang drawing that's that's the key question and um, it might be I yeah. think it is um in which case he has just copied it I mean there's if you want to be critical you can say that's quite lazy maybe there's not much thought gone into these at all um but I think you can make a counter argument for that mm. as well I also wondered, uh, the panels where um, the heraldic symbols had been replaced with um, most, I think, all black men. Um, I completely agree. I don't think they're as fine as his other, his other work. But I wondered if that was perhaps some sort of commentary on obviously heraldic symbols or a, 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 you know, a status symbol and also that kind of European um, family history kind of tracking that it's, you know, it's about these big family names and big family trees. Whereas family history from his sort of West African heritage is oral history, isn't it? And it's passed down through people. And I wondered if that was perhaps, uh, you know, a commentary on on his behalf. Um, on yeah, that kind of I, I think he's interested in power and status. Um, I mean, heraldry is also about kind of ownership as well. Um, and, and portraiture really is an art form that, you know, if you have your port, if you have a historic portrait, you were rich or famous. <laughs> um, so there's there's a kind of implicit status I think in in portraiture and, and that of course has kind of changed rather with with photography and and and, and printmaking but um, with regard to kind of painting still I mean many of us have photographs of ourselves how many of us have paintings of, of ourselves on the walls um, so I think what he's he's trying to do is is re reposition the a kind of lost group of peoples mm. into the art of portraiture and um, also pointing out uh, that 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 kind of lack of representation in, in doing so, which is, is quite effective. Uh, we had a question from Suzanne who asks about the jewel or the kind of brooch that Mark Shavers is wearing. I think it's on his left hand side on the fur collar. Um, do we have any idea what that is? Yeah. Or why it was chosen. Perhaps. On the first. Yeah, yeah, this is really, if you come to see the, the glass, um, if I don't mention the Krispy Kreme donut, um, someone else will. Um, and, and it comes up, it does really look like a Krispy Kreme chocolate sprinkle donut. But I think it's a brooch. Um, and I, the fur is interesting because my guess is that Mark Shavers did not own that fur, uh, that he came into the studio wearing his gold trainers and his denim outfit, and that he saw the fur in the studio and 
decided that he wanted to wear it and that was how he was captured. But I don't know exactly what the brooch is. Um, it's interesting because I, I think I talked about the mediation of images here and what we've got in the resultant stained glass is a stained glass panel made from a cartoon by an artist who was working from photographs. And in that translation, I think some of the details are lost. Um, and, and the photographs that, 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 that Wiley kind of produced of, of Mark Shavers, of course, is combined with his looking at an image of the Ang design. So you lose some of the detail each time that image is adapted in a different medium and uh, that each time that you're looking at a copy, not the original. So the, the other thing that people say is, why is he holding a golden egg? Um, at which point we say, well, as you can see in the text panel, um, it explains here that it's a coin. And, but actually, I think the anchor drawing of the coin is, is not so great, but it, the, the quality and the clarity has been lost each time it's been copied. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Roger. He says, the Penn Station Sistine ceiling, how was it made? It looks like an 18th century painting using glass as a canvas. Yeah, um, it is more enamel painting um, and certainly layers of glass. Um, I'd have to ask more questions to you, Richard and Jika, but I'm just wondering, there we go, I did. Um, these are these images. I should say I have pinched from Slow Art Studios. So thank you, Slow Art Studios. Um, uh, these are images um, that I have taken from them. Um, but you can see that the piece is being assembled here. So I think you're right. I think there's quite a lot of enamel painting on glass. Um, and as a painter, I guess he was perhaps more drawn to that. It, it's interesting because if you think about another modern piece like the Hockney Window, Hockney was drawn to the pure colour of the glass didn't want any paint at all. And I think actually Wiley is interested in the colour of the glass, but also really wants that hyper realism that you can only get with painting. And you can look at the, the, the head there. Um, I believe that's the same head. And I think there's multiple layers to give that real depth and realism, mm. which of course is something that's been practiced uh, over many years. So while we're looking at this panel, which we can see the, the trainers and the tracksuits on so clearly, um, Italia asks if Wiley, um, like if, if brands like Nike, Timberlake, Adidas or whatever, um, if they ever comment on kind of um, Wiley's work and, um, and also if he plans to produce any more stained glass work or, you know, if he's moving away from canvas and more into glass work. Um, the answer to both is I don't know. I mean, I should say that a lot of this, as you probably guessed, I'm I'm hoping to, to write it up. I've started writing it up. I keep getting um, distracted by other things. So it's kind of ongoing research. But I haven't seen anything that that Nike um, have have said. But I, I do know that in, in some reviews, um, in some reviews, people have kind of said, oh, it's just a glorified advert for, you know, capitalism. Um, but I guess contemporary society does revolve a lot around con con capitalism, especially in the West. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, was there sponsorship? One would have to do to find out um, somehow. This was a, a public art commission, but it was funded. Um, and architects, of course, were building on the building. So maybe there was some corporate sponsorship. I, I don't know. That said, the Nike stuff appears in his early work that's, that's exhibition pieces. So it's not just in, in the ceiling. As for what he's doing next, honestly don't know but it is always exciting and I didn't show you any of the photographs or the sculpture but he's produced some really really interesting pieces and, and as someone who kind of studied art history it's always nice to have examples of an artist who's engaging with art history in such a direct way and especially if you're teaching kind of young younger ones um you know this is perfect for for a level and and fine art teaching um in, in terms of covering the contemporary but also that history and um joe asks why we chose the position of the gap force in adelaide in the gallery why was it placed um where it is uh, and not sort of close to the front or perhaps near some of the other portraits like um george the third that's a really good question joe and really thoughtful i'm glad you asked it um the, the honest and only answer um, is that that is the only place it would fit. 
Um, it's not on the ground floor because um, we don't own the, well, we don't own the Triforium, but we, this, our space starts upstairs. And the cathedral, I did, did talk to them about the possibility of putting on the ground floor because I would have liked it to be accessible to more people, but it, it didn't happen for one reason or another. Um, but what you can see here is the enormous operation <laughs> that it, it took to get it, it up the stairs. Um, unfortunately, with the restrictions of our space and the size of that piece, it did mean that we didn't actually have a choice about where it went. There was one space where it could go and I wanted it to be on display. Um, so it's it's gone there. It has the kind of unfortunate, which I didn't realize till it was up. The un, the unfortunate thing is that it's kind of standing on its own as the only piece on that wall, which is not at all deliberate because we weren't trying to separate it in that way. Um, but that's because there's a kind of flat bit of the wall that, that it, it can sit in. But the, the good thing is that there, there's space in front of it for people to gather, and it does naturally bring people together in front of it. We've we've really observed that um, people stop and engage with it in a different way to the other pieces because it's it's a surprise and they're not expecting to see it there which is exactly what we had kind of hoped at the same time it fits in very well as i tried to demonstrate so yeah it's quite an operation getting getting the piece into the building um, and up the stairs uh, it was actually we managed to carry the glass upstairs because it comes into sections but the the, the frame the light box that came with it which I was very pleased about because it saved us some money getting a new light box. Um, so we said, yes, we'll have the light box. But then um, it was too big to go up the stairs. So we had to get hoist in and uh, kindly ask the cathedral workforce to help us just um, carry it over the side there. So that's what you can see in this image. And there are some helpful art installers who um, came to help us fit it. And on the day that it was installed, my dog came to see it up. He, he was one of the first visitors to the piece. We were, we were delighted to get it up actually, just like the day before we reopened in May. It was, um, we were up there working quite hard to do that. Brilliant, I think that was all of the questions that we had. So I am sure we will all join in a virtual round of applause for Jasmine and thanking her for this evening's lecture. And, <laughs> Do we have a no? Um, so we will look forward to our next lecture um, over the next two weeks. So on Wednesday, the 6th of October, and then the final one on the 13th. We hope to see you, as many of you there as possible. And uh, we will say goodbye. Yeah, thank you for joining.